Bitcoin is the new currency, it will replace the dollar, it will replace the euro, and it will replace the yen. We are going to live that world. We are going into complete science fiction here. I think it'll be very clear 10 years from now that, yeah, I don't I don't really want US dollars anymore. Bitcoin's probably in the five to 10 million range. Yeah. This is going up relative to the sixth power of time. So it's going up in a linear fashion, very predictably. There's so much money out there that most of the money is still on the fences. It's just the very tip is coming into Bitcoin at this point. Bitcoin's fundamentally not compatible with KYC. KYC doesn't work. It's completely and utterly useless thing. That, by the way, was exactly what Satoshi created Bitcoin for. It's peer to peer. I'm very bullish on these ETFs. We haven't seen anything yet. It's just going to grow like crazy if we got to 200,000 in the next six months. Where do you see Bitcoin's future in like 20 years price level, but also like uh, in general, where, where, do, where do you see Bitcoin involved in 20 years? So what I think, I think Bitcoin is money. And I think it is a replacement for the fiat system that we have now. Uh, and I do think that in 20 years, if you go to a restaurant, you'll be paying in Bitcoin. If you go to a hotel, you'll be paying in Bitcoin and you'll probably be paying your taxes in Bitcoin as well. Okay. So I actually believe that Bitcoin is the new currency. It will replace the dollar. It will replace the Euro and it will replace the yen. That's what I believe. Okay. Now, You know, these things take a long time and they're sort of hard to see. There's such, you know, they're, it, it, it's been going for 15 years. And so will it have completely done it by 20 years? No, but I think it'll be pretty obvious that it, that it will be there. We may be in sort of this buy system, you know, where there, there still is the euro to some extent, but most people are using Bitcoin. Um, you know, we've seen sort of these uh, changes where, you know, you had, two sort of things working at the same time. I remember when the Euro came into uh, France, you know, I was, I was in France at the time, you know, and we had this transition from the franc to the Euro, you know, and for a while you could exchange French francs for Euro. And then after a while, those French francs were not exchangeable anymore, you know? And, uh, and I still have some, you know, somewhere in, I have an old 500 franc bill, you know, that, uh, But it's useless, it's, it, you know, I can't even go to the central bank and exchange it anymore. But I do think that we're in this phase of, of, of that. So I do think it's the new world money. And I think it's going to change everything because it's not just, it's not money that you can print. It's, you know, it has this finite supply. So it's a different kind of money. Uh, that, that kind of money will, will, um, will be used as a savings account as well as, as a, sort of a checking account in one. Um, but I think in order to get there, I think we have to get to, you know, over Bitcoin 1 million in order to get to the point where it fulfills that role, right? So I think if everybody's using Bitcoin as, as sort of the money that everybody uses, Bitcoin's probably in the, you know, five to 10 million kind of mark kind of range you know, somewhere around there, you know, uh, depending on what, it, you know, uh, what the price of a cu cup of coffee is, which is sort of a, you know, uncertainty. But I do think that's where we're going with this thing is it is, it's a fundamental shift in, in money um, as far as, you know, this sort of better money, but it's also a fundamental shift in like the power of, these large governments to just endlessly print money to do whatever they want. Uh, I think it's going to reduce that power sub substantially. Hey, I also think like that because I personally have like a hundred percent in Bitcoin. So um, I would love to also like be able to spend it, pay my taxes in there and all of everything. And it's kind of a pain in the ass right now because I cannot spend it. Uh, there are like two reasons that kind of prevent it. First of all, like it's very volatile, which makes it a little bit less attractive to like spend it uh, because there could be such a high uh, swing up. And the second one is the bigger one. It's like tax implications. Like I, I would have to pay taxes if there are gains on the, the, the things that when I spend it. Um, but I think with, when we are coming there and, and Bitcoin is going there, is, is it then kind of the f invention of money because it's the first asset that is just 
the use case of money, like gold has some use cases in industrial things. Uh, other things also have like some other use cases. It's kind of like the, the first. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's an invention of certain kind of money. Look, I think if you look at, for example, you know, what is the internet, right? Well, the internet sort of evolved from being the World Wide Web under Tim Berners-Lee, that vision of the internet, right, where we're going to have these textual websites to then we had sort of, you know, things like Macromedia Flash and these kind of very heavy websites, right, to then we had a website, really just a page on Facebook. You know what I mean? So things evolve, right? So money has evolved just like the internet has evolved. What the what the internet is is, is so different from what Tim Berners-Lee thought the internet or the, the web was, right? It's it's completely changed. And I think money is is going to change. But I, I do think that that's going to be kind of the last version of money, right? So I think that's that's the one that sort of sticks. And I don't think, and I do think there will be some changes to Bitcoin even 20 years from now, right? But I think they'll be subtle. Um, you know, I, I do feel like most of the work was done with Satoshi. And that there's, you know, there's a few tweaks that are still needed probably uh, to really uh, scale it and so on. Um, but by and far, for the most part, it's, it's, it's solved. Do you, do you have already something like that that you see now that we kind of have to to solve and kind of like the small tweaks that we have to make or is, is that kind of not hard to see right now? Well, I think, look, I think it's, it's pretty clear to me that if it, you're going to need to have uh, these layer twos, right? You're going to need to have some version of layer two. Now that could mean, that could mean, you know, lightning that could mean sort of custodial type layer twos like cash app right uh it could mean something more fundamental like you know some of this op cat stuff that people are talking about right with with working with things other other blockchains potentially right to kind of uh to to get to make it but you're going to need to have some changes to bitcoin to do that you're going to need to change have certain op codes that are added to bitcoin to do that. Uh, I don't think it's something that we need to worry about now today. Uh, but I do think it's kind of inevitable that Bitcoin, Bitcoin right now has this fundamental limit that you have about 200 million transactions per year that can happen on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Now, if you're going to use the Bitcoin blockchain in any way, and even if it's going to be used with lightning, right? And you have a billion people using it, you know, you really have those people can only use it once every five years. <laughs> you know, so it, it, you know, unless you're, it's just this pet rock that you can hold and you can sell every five years. It doesn't scale to the billion person level as is right now, right? You, you just can't, you don't get there, you know? So you need, we're not at the point of, you know, urgency. It's, but, and it can scale, right? We can get it to go up. Uh, now, you know, one way that, you know, people were talking about back in 2016, 20, from 2015 to 2017 was to increase the block size, right? And there was obviously these huge wars around that, right? Um, in the end, the sort of smaller block size won, you know, uh, for now, I would say. Uh, and look, it was, it won by a compromise, right? We started at one megabyte, right? We kind of ended at four, kind of, you know, with SegWit. Um, but it, you know, it was a very much of a compromise and, and I think sort of nobody really loves the current system that much. Uh, but you know, could it go, could it go up to 16 megabytes? Uh, yeah, it could, you know what I mean? Like it's, there's not, it's not a huge problem right now from a cost of storage perspective to go that high. Now you could argue that that may not solve Bitcoin's total scalability, even if it was four times as big as it is today, right? That, and that, that, that's probably true. Um, but that's one way you can change it, right? The other way you can change it, I think, uh, a better way is to have certain op codes that you can, that you can use so that it's interchangeable, that you can have wrapped Bitcoin on other blockchains. And it could be on Ethereum. It could be on, you know, a blockchain that doesn't even exist today, right? Um, it could be on private blockchains. It could be on even uh, central bank digital uh, currency blockchains, right? 
there could be all kinds of ways that you could that you can wrap Bitcoin and and allow for it to be moved in and out in a in a kind of a very safe way, right? But uh, we're going to have to do something if Bitcoin starts being used for commerce. We have to do something. Uh, what that is is to be determined, and I'm sure that they're going to fight like crazy. It'll be similar to the block wars of of, of between 2015 and 2017. So I'm sure there will be fights, but I, I am also convinced that uh, Bitcoin will uh, make the right decision, right? I'm, I feel like the community will make the right decision and, and Bitcoin will evolve in the, in the kind of the correct way. It's just a belief, you know, I didn't have that belief necessarily in 2016, right? So I think, well, I think it, you know, it was a little more scary back then, but now I think we're, we're in better shape. What what shaped this belief of yours? Like, uh, how how did you come to to have this better belief of of Bitcoin? Well, you know, look if you if you go back to the, that period, right? We had people like you know Craig Wright, right, who were uh, you know pushing these narratives, and you know Roger Ver, and there was a lot of narratives. And I think we know, we're, we all know more now than we knew back then, right? And so. Uh, and I think we, we also understand what are the objectives more, right? Well, we all kind of want something that there's no, there's nobody in charge of Bitcoin, right? The, it, it's, it's not somebody who says, I have Satoshi's vision. We, nobody wants that, right? Also, nobody wants some enormous f footprint that can only run in some big data center, right? Having your own node is a very desirable thing that everybody can have their own node. And, you know, if, if people can signal their interest in forks on their own node and not just miners, that's also a good thing. So I think the, I think the community is, 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 is probably in a better shape than it was, you know, in say in 2017, 2018. I mean, it wasn't clear a hundred percent clear to me, who was going to win Bitcoin cash or Bitcoin regular Bitcoin in 2017? It, it, you know, it was sort of like you could make the case that Bitcoin was going to disintegrate into, into all these competing forks. And now I, it, now we're also in a, we have the ETF, we have Michael Saylor, we have, you know, we have, we have Institute, we have the adults are in the room, you know? So I think we're in a, a much better place of than than Bitcoin was, you know, in the sort of tenth anniversary of its, you know, existence. That that's for sure. And I feel like the the community is really has grown. And I mean, I'm just here since 2020, so I cannot even really speak about the uh, the aspect before. Um, the, the aspect of the full node, like the blocks, is also interesting because I feel like storage costs will go down over time. So it will be interesting. What will the, the same storage that you now need to for full node to get uh, cost in like 10 years, 20 years when we get better. Well, I mean, it, it, you have, it's going down like much faster than uh, it's going down as Moore's law. Right. So bear in mind that look, SegWit, you know, was sort of decided in 2017. Right. So this, this, we are this four megabytes. Okay. We are, uh, prices have come down 10 X since then. 10 X at least. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, so, you know, you can, you can, you know, you can build your own Bitcoin node for $150, right? I did, you know, two years ago I did for, probably today it's the same thing would be a hundred dollars, right? And it's not even the store, the storage is $10, you know, the chip. So, you know, for a terabyte, you know, so like it's the cost of storage is not actually a factor anymore. Um, you know. I, I'm not saying we should have, you know, multiple terabytes for, for, bit, for Bitcoin, but, you know, 700 megabytes to store Bitcoin is nothing right now. It's, it's not a it's just not really a factor. So I, I, I definitely think we could go bigger, but I don't, obviously right now we don't have the need for it. And, you know, I, I also agree that I agree with Michael Saylor and, and the general Bitcoin community that unless there's an absolute pressing need and we, you know, the community is 90% in agreement that anything should be done, we should do nothing, right? 
So we have to have almost 90% consensus in order to start touching Bitcoin at this point. Um, and But I think at some point we will have 90% consensus on something. I mean, we, we had for Taproot, believe it or not, you know. For Taproot, we had 90% consensus. And I think we had it because people were viewing this thing as, okay, this is a very technical thing that enables Schnorr signatures. It, it helps lightning and it enables uh, privacy of addresses, of multi-sig addresses. Okay, people are like, that can't hurt. That's probably a good thing. Great, I support it. So everybody was supportive of this thing. Uh, they probably wouldn't be supportive of it today, right? <laughs> because of all the ordinals and everything. So, you know, it, it's sort of, so I think that the question is, it, it, you know, if we get to a point where, if, if I think if, if fees got to $100 per Bitcoin transaction very, very routinely, I think we would, people would say, wait a second, this is, this is not, this is not what, so, this is not the, 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 forget what even Satoshi would have wanted. This is not the correct way we should be living. It should not cost $100 to send a Bitcoin transaction. That's ridiculous. So, you know, it, it should cost a, a couple dollars or less, I think, in an ideal world. That's interesting because I had, I feel like, I think, Wicked it was on, and he spoke about future Bitcoin transactions. He thinks that like Bitcoin transactions on a base layer will be extremely expensive and only for like a small institutional and small players. Yeah, I, I think you lose something if you do that, right? I mean, you know, it's again, that's, you know, we go from you have to have this enormous data center to run a node, right? That's bad because it's great to run your own node or you know very easily right i i mean to me the one of the the most appealing things about bitcoin is its simplicity right it's a it's a small client the client the initial client was thirty thousand lines of code right so it's a very small client it's a very simple conceptually to explain everything about bitcoin right you can really get your head around the whole thing um and and you can transact with bitcoin you can approach it. You can do your first actual Bitcoin transaction yourself pretty easily. You know, I mean, I could send you $5 worth of Bitcoin, you know, not a problem. And I think if we get to these really high fees where only institutions can send it, I think we lose something. You know, it's not for the people anymore. It's sort of like you need these institutions to actually send the Bitcoin. I, I That I don't, I disagree with. I don't think... You know, I think I'll have that debate with Wicked because I just do not agree with that idea. Like, I'd say, is that the reason we're having, you know, four megabyte blocks, you know, with SegWit? Like, no, you know, at that point, go to 16 megabyte blocks, go to 100 megabyte blocks, you know, but figure out some way that these Bitcoin fees should not be $500, $1,000 per, per fee. That, that does not, that's not a common sense. It doesn't make any common sense to me. Yeah, it, it, it still, uh, it's it's correct. I feel like I mean, I don't think. Look, let me put it this way, Robin. You you've done some Bitcoin transactions yourself. Go back to when you discovered Bitcoin, right? You know, what was the very first wallet or uh, that you used for for Bitcoin for your uh, very first transaction? A ledger. <laughs> okay, so you use ledger, right? Now, if you if you bought a ledger and you sent and you sent some Bitcoin to somebody else or to your, you know, another address that you have, and it cost you a hundred dollars. You would be like, do I really want to try this thing? You know, you would, you know, it would, it, and, and also you're living in a kind of a, uh, you're living in a uh, first world country, right? Now imagine you're a person in El Salvador, you know, and you're like a hundred dollars is, you know, a week's salary or whatever, right? You're not going to be, you're just going to be like, this is, this is terrible. I don't want to have anything to do with this thing. So I just think it's, it, 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 it does not make sense. I understand why people are, they've gone to that way of thinking. Um, I do not think that it's needed for the security of Bitcoin. I do not believe that is the case. Okay. We have sufficient exahash of, of mining power right now 
Bitcoin is secure. You know, it, we we the we do not need to feel sorry for these miners. You know, it's an intensely competitive business, and even if half of them went out of business, it wouldn't make any any change at all to the security of this of Bitcoin. It's, it's true, and also, also like uh, even like the the business is so fast growing. Like the the hash rate is going up like crazy in the in the last couple of years. Like if you see the chart in like the last five years, how the hash rate is growing, it's it's uh, fascinating. Well, I mean the yeah, I mean it's going at it's growing kind of at the the twelfth power of time. So if you you know if you look at these power law models, right? Uh, it, it, you know the price is going up relative to the sixth power of time. So Bitcoin price is going to the time measured uh, from the you know from say twenty ten right or two thousand nine, whatever you want to do. But let's just say. 2010, which was sort of the first prices of Bitcoin, right? So if you look at uh, time from 2010 and, uh, and you know, and you look at the price of Bitcoin, it's gone up at the time to the power six, roughly. If you look at hash rate, it's gone up at the square of that. So time to the power 12. And if you look at adoption, it's sort of time to the power cubed roughly so there's there's a very clear kind of growth uh model for bitcoin with these power laws kind of you know they're not you know you can you could say they're kind of a religion i do think that they're rather amazing but there is a clear pattern of we've got this adoption that's leading to this price and that's leading to this hash rate for, for the few people that might never heard of the power law, I feel like <laughs> right now yeah. most of them heard about it. But what is it and yeah. why is it so intriguing for you? Well, it's the intriguing thing is that um, Bitcoin, if you look at Bitcoin and you're just looking at it without looking at it in log log terms, right? If you're just looking at it normally, your your narrative is this thing is very risky, right? And it goes up. It went up a lot in 2018. There was 2017. It crashed in 2018. It went up a lot in 2020. It crashed in 2022. Uh, now it's back up, but it just seems completely volatile, right? Like why would there's no rhyme or reason to this thing? It goes up. It goes down. It crashes. Now, if you look at it on a log basis, where Bitcoin price is on a log, it looks like well, it's going up, but it's sort of like going up a little less fast. And then if you look at it on a log log basis, you're like, oh, wow, this thing is kind of a line, right? It's going up in a linear fashion, very predictably, uh, with actually sort of a reasonable volatility to it in log log terms. So I think it's a it's it's an important um, discovery uh, that uh, that Bitcoin actually is is obeying this very sort of regular progression. And um, and this Italian uh, physicist, uh, Giovanni, kind of first observed this and, you know, pointed it out and nobody cared. And, uh, you know, he, he was sort of ignored. And, uh, you know, and he sort of, uh, one, of the, one of the things I've tried to do is try to, explain to people what he's <laughs> what he did you know and so i was sort of saying look you should you know, give give the man some credit he found this this uh this incredible this incredible relationship and and since then there's been a lot of other people who have looked at these laws and gone back and done the math and the analysis and the statistics themselves and they were yeah there is this power law it really does exist and you know it, it it's predictive and it gives you some sense of um where we where we where we're going which is higher but also kind of what range what kind of confidence interval do we have in in like where it's going to be in 10 years right and so the power law tells you well we should be at roughly a million dollars per coin in 10 years but you know we Step some pretty big bands around that, right? So we could be, we might be at on the low end, two hundred thousand. On the high end, we might be at two million, right? 
You know, so that, those are sort of some bands that you can look at the power law and you can get some idea of kind of like the range of outcomes and their likelihood, it, you know, if you just follow the statistics of this progression. Uh, and I, I, I do believe in that broadly. I think it's, uh, it's really cool because um, like I, I'm full on Bitcoin. Like I, 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 I just huddle and, and just buy in with whatever yeah. I got. Uh, but I think it's useful to have models. Like I would not bet on it. Like I would never like, oh, I, I set it now like a, a higher bet because the power law says like now in the next like few months we have a higher uh, growth rate. I would not bet on it, but it's definitely useful to explain it. And I feel like it's also a good guidance. Like you see like a little bit it's in the very, future. It's very broad though. You say you can't, it's not like it, there's, it doesn't tell you, uh, okay, and now I'm going to buy a little bit more and now I'm going to sell some. It's not like technical analysis, right? Um, it, it really doesn't give you that level of, uh, uh, of precision. Now, you know, if we got to say 200,000 in the next six months, right? Let's say six or nine months, the power law would tell you that you're at the higher end of the band, right? So you might, it might be a sort of a, an indication that you should take some money off the table. You know, we're, we're kind of not there yet. We're right. We're kind of right in the middle of the, the range. Uh, but I, it could tell you, you know, that um, that maybe now is a good time to sell. And, you know, it also did. It was very, very accurate on the bottoms. Right. So it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, uh, back in November of, you know, uh, 2022, it was just like, yeah, you should just be completely all in, you know. 16,000, you know, it, it, it really, the bottoms are incredibly accurate. The tops are less accurate. What do you think, uh, could like, if it could break this model, what could it be like? Is, is it like a, a child, like Apple coming in, like, oh, we buy 50% of our balance sheet, like this year if Bitcoin is there something like that? Well, look, it could break on both directions, right? So it could break on the downside as well. Right. So. Uh, what could break it on the upside? I think, let's say the U.S. declared Bitcoin legal tender, you know, that would be, that would, bre that would probably break it. I think, you know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, I think at some point the U.S. I think will declare it legal tender, right? I, I just don't think, but I, for, but for every one of those ifs, there's another, there's a, there's a lot of thing tendencies, you know? So, you know, look, there's, there's the good news is there's about, I don't know, it, net net of the GBTC stuff. There's about $16 billion that have come into the new ETFs, which is great. I mean, it's on the high end of what everybody expected, right? But on the other hand, it's still just a, a very small fraction of the kind of money that's invested in the bond market, you know, um, you know, we, we have a, you know, a hundred trillion dollar worldwide bond market. Um, you know, you know, we're talking about a tenth of a percent going into Bitcoin. You know, so it's 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 sort of small, right? And uh, you know, I started my my career in in, in Wall Street, and I e even back when I was on Wall Street, these were small numbers. You know, <laughs> the, the and they they've gone up ten x easily since. You know, so. You know, the, there's so much money out there uh, that most of the money is still on the fences. It's just, you know, the just the very tip is coming into Bitcoin at this point. So, you know, there, there's a there's a ton of money out there. Uh, and it's, sort of, it's it's the it's sort of the reverse of the money printer, right? The the money printer goes burr. Well, where does that money end up? It ends up like in bonds. It ends up in, you know, uh it ends up in ex overpriced real estate. It, it ends up in stocks at 35 times earnings that, that are not that great, you know? So all this money is out there. It, you know, it doesn't disappear. There's a law of conservation of money, right? So <laughs> this, this money stays somewhere. And so this money can come back into Bitcoin very easily. Um, you would think, right. But it's, you know, the, the, there is this uh, drag. This there's there's this there's sort of a, 
a resistance to change, right? And, um, you know, so it's coming in slowly. But at some point, it, I think it will, it will really happen. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example. When I first, when I was on Wall Street and I, you know, came in in the late 80s, right? Stocks were not widely viewed as a, a place you wanted to invest, right? People would say you wanted to invest in bonds. That, that was the kind of conventional wisdom, right? And bonds at that point were yielding, you know, 10%, right? And so you could put your money and you could get 10% in the bond market. Wow, that's good. You know, you could, you could be a little less risky and you could put your money in treasury bills and you could get 8%, right? You know, so, um, but, you know, why would you go and put your money in stocks? That was, that was a crazy idea, right? So, you know, fast forward, you know, 40 years later, um, not for 30, 30 plus years later, right? Now everybody and their brother is in stocks, right? It's viewed as this like completely natural thing. They just pour your money in stocks. You measure everything relative to the stock market and everything. So in 30 years, we've gone from, yeah, stocks are kind of in, sort of interesting, but they're risky to, no, no, that's absolutely the right way to go. So I think it may take 20 years, really, you know, for people to start really embracing what Bitcoin can be. It's, it's not going to happen overnight, um, you know, and, and com- places like Apple, they're they're conservative. You know, they're they're doing well. They're, they don't want to upset the Apple cart. So uh, on the other hand, if Amazon does it, then Apple has to do it. Right. So, you know, they're. I, I'm, I look, I'm super enthusiastic for the stuff longer term, but I also, I, you know, and I also be, I'm, the, I'd be the happiest man on the planet if, uh, if the power law breaks to the upside, right? <laughs> I'm not going to be like, Oh my God, the model's broken. I hate life. No, I'm going to be like, thank you. You know? So I, I just, I think the power law is pretty bullish, right? It says you're going to get to a million dollars in, in 10 years. Uh, that would be amazing by my, you know, by my account. So, you know, I think I, I just think we should kind of tone back expectations a little bit as to the how fast the stuff actually moves, and it moves quickly, but um, but perhaps not as quickly as some people would like it to move. Yeah, there's this impatient and the human being coming out to feel like sometimes. Yeah, we're all we're all you know we're just the worst. Uh, we're we're the worst investors and we're our biggest worst enemies, right? And uh, you know Warren Buffett, you know even though he hates Bitcoin, he is right about that. You know it it all is about temperament, right? You know, and if you have the right temperament, and you're willing to you know, let things, let good bets just sit for decades. You're going to do extremely well. And most of us are completely not not that built that way. Right. I'm not built that way. Right. So I'm, I'm impatient myself. And, uh, uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that I feel with Bitcoin is having kind of seen companies like Microsoft, you know, had, you know, I've had money and, invested in companies like Microsoft, but then sold my shares, right? Or invested in Apple and sold my shares. Apple stock has been, you know, in terms of price movement, you know, it's gone up 100x from 20, 2000 and, uh, from the iPhone, from 2008. It's gone up 100x. It's not quite as much as Bitcoin, but it's pretty remarkable, right? From Microsoft, from... The IPO, it's gone up three thousand x. Microsoft, you know. So, uh, yeah, and, th- and these are old kind of things, but now we have Tesla and other things. So, there are growth stories. And if you're if you're in if you're kind of in finance and in investments and stuff, you you see these things long enough, and you're just kind of like, okay, I can't miss the next one, you know. And so. And, you know, you first have to identify it. That's usually the easy thing, right? The hard thing is not taking your money off the table. That's the hard thing, you know, because there's some, something, somebody says, uh, Robin, you know, it's, uh, 
you know, it's time to time to settle down. You need a bigger house. Uh, you got to think about those kids. You know, it's not all about Bitcoin. And you're going to be like, yeah, okay, I'll sell my big, I'll buy a house, you know, something like that, you know. Uh, so there's there's all these voices inside you. Some advisor is going to be saying, well, okay, your Bitcoin's worth a lot of money. Now you should diversify. You know, I recommend this diversified strategy. And, uh, you know, if you listen to that person, you may sell all your Bitcoin, right? So, and I don't even think this is a Bitcoin specific thing. It's just a... You know, look, right now, Steve Ballmer owns more, has, is a higher net worth than Mike, uh, Bill Gates because Steve Ballmer just kept his Microsoft and Bill Gates diversified into farmland and, you know, medical stuff and whatever. But Steve Ballmer just kept his, his uh, Microsoft. And so now he's worth more than Bill Gates. So I definitely think that time in the market is really important here. Uh, and so, you know, congratulations, you know, you, you, you've identified Bitcoin as a winner. Now, let's see if you can hold on, not even do anything different, not even like add to what you're doing, but just hold on, you know, to what you got, you know, that, that I think is the, that that's the challenge we all face. Right. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. The, the doing nothing part is the hard one yeah i, I, I really mean i hard. come I, I come from the stock world and i was really big on tesla i mean like 1100 percent or something like that and I actually fronted everything then in into in bitcoin like i did that before with other stocks uh right, then i right. went all in, in in tesla and now i'm bitcoin i mean both tesla and bitcoin did kind of well since then but uh it's 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 hard to stay on one thing like not to get excited about other things like just stay that and i want to get in this uh because you have done a lot in your life you have done uh with math you have in wall street with all the things that you have done in life um what are maybe connected with that some strategies some some learnings that you have that you are now getting into with bitcoin well i mean first of all i think math is a great subject that every if if you're going to college or something i always tell people like Take, take a lot of math, right? And, uh, and the reason I say it is you never know when you're, not, when you're going to be able to use that math or the, that way of thinking, right? So, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, it's not directly applicable. Nothing you do is directly applicable, right? But I've noticed that math people can think about problems really quickly and they understand they understand these problems quantitatively much better than other people. So I think the math is a great kind of tool to help form your brain uh, about things. So I, I, I love math and I've used math throughout my entire life, you know, when it, whether I'm, you know, working on some advertising thing or anything else. I always, I always look at life very mathematically. Um, you know, I think the, uh, uh, you know, learnings about life in general. Um, you know, I think it, a lot of everything is timing, right? So, uh, you know, it's sort of, you got to be at the right place at the right time. Now at the right place might be, you know, in Bitcoin, right? When Bitcoin's going, right? It might be being in Stanford, right? In the eighties, you know, when kind of like you walk around and, you know, you see the laser printer being invented or you see, the, you know, the Xerox park that led to the, the, the Mac, right? Uh, so you, you sort of, 
you're just around things when they're percolating that they're, they're percolating somewhere. And so being in, being in the right place at the right time is really important. So that keeps on changing, right? So I would say right now, what's the most interesting sort of thing that's happening in the world by far is artificial intelligence, right? That's, that's probably the thing that's going to change our lives the most. Um, and over the next 20 years, you know, and, uh, so I would say focus on the higher order bit, which is what, what is the thing that's going to change the world the most? And I would say right now it's probably AI is number one and Bitcoin is number two. That's, that's what, if I had to rank them now, as far as an investment, unfortunately, I don't think you can just invest in AI, right? That's because we don't have, there's no clear you know, you can invest in Google, they're doing some AI, you know, you can invest in Microsoft, they're doing some AI, but it's not clear who's going to, you know, who's going to win AI. It's just not clear, right? Um, just like in the internet, you know, if you ask people who is going to, what's the best internet play at probably a lot of investors would have said Cisco, right? Because they make the they make the routers, right, that everybody needs in the internet. So that would have been sort of the consensus play, right? So NVIDIA right now is sort of the consensus play for AI, but it's not clear to me that, you know, the maybe the application layer on AI is really going to be it. Maybe, you know, maybe it's really chat GPT just ends up becoming, you know, the AI play for the next 20 years. We don't know, right? I would probably bet on chat GPT, right? Right. If I, if that was a public company, I would want to own that company, right? Just because I, it does feel to me like that's the next Google, but you never know. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one to handicap. So I think from an investment perspective, I like Bitcoin from what's going to change the world. AI is going to change the world. You know, it's going to change the world the most because if we, if we can have uh, machines that think, and machines that can build factories, you know, you know, like if a machine can decide how to build the next Tesla factory, you know, like what, what, what do we need it for? Exactly. Not, not clear that we have any role at all. Right. Just, you know, just kind of entertain us, produce, produce movies for us to watch. I don't know, you know, but it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's AI is something as significant as the industrial revolution, you know, and we're kind of the we're kind of the, uh, you know, the city dwellers of of Europe in the 17, the early 17th or 1600s, you know, and, you know, yeah, they, they can make porcelain and stuff like that, but they don't have the steam engine, you know, and then all of a sudden now we have the ability to make you know, yarn and we can, you know, we can, we can make clothes and we have these, you know, this, we can make, we have cars and we have, you know, so to me, that was the first major things, the industrial revolution. Now, now we have, we sort of had the information revolution, but that is not as big as the ability to have machines that think. And I think I machines think. that think is, is going to change absolutely everything. And, and that's probably how it looks. I did not think that would happen in my life. Um, you know, it was. And then when I was at Stanford, I was uh, is, is interesting because I actually have a paper, uh, a published paper in AI uh, from 1986. Yeah. In the IEEE transactions of uh, artificial intelligence and pattern recognition. So I was I was dealing with sort of. Tom Cover in the stats and information the science department at, at uh, Stanford. And we were talking a lot about AI in the time. And um, it was, it just, it didn't seem like it was going to really work. Right. Well, but there were certain ideas of machine learning, right. Even back in the eighties, you know, it just didn't really seem like it's not, maybe this approach is not going to work. Right. And so, you know, and I've, I, you know, for the last 30 years, I've been sort of uh, bearish. I sort of think I, it'll never happen. They'll never be able to understand 
talk, would never have chat GPT in my life, you know? And so to me, this is absolutely magic that, that, it, that it's, that it's, that it's already where it is. And, you know, I, I think where it's going to be in five years is going to, it'll change everything, right? It will absolutely change everything. So I think it's, that's a really positive thing. And if I was, you know, advising a young person right now, you know, and I have um, a son who's about to, you know, he's going to go to college year after next, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of like, like, you need to, whatever you do, you can be on the business side of it. You can be wherever you are, but you need to realize how AI is going to impact the world, right? There's, you don't have to necessarily be a coder, right? You could, you could be any, there's, but there's, you want to be around that, right? You want to be, you want to be around that, that level of that nexus of, of, uh, excitement. And if you're around that, you're going to do very well. Right. And you're going to have a very rewarding life, I think. So I think uh, that's what I would do. I would just, I mean, I know I would probably just be completely engaged in AI right now. Um, but you know, I, I, it, it, it's, it's something that's fine to look at too, and just sort of observe and, you know, maybe you have something that you can add or somehow with the area that you're getting involved in, but it definitely feels to me like uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to be on some kind of hockey stick with AI very soon, you know, and I just have absolutely no idea where it's going. You know, like the, the idea that Elon Musk can say that there's going to be two humanoids per human, <laughs> two robots per human is just insane to me, but it, you know, it's probably accurate, you know, I, you know, we probably towards the end of my life, I will have a robot that does the dishes, you know, you know, and, and that, you know, can, can run errands for me, you know, <laughs> go to the store and get me some milk, you know, it, and the robot will just walk out the door and, and start running to the store and come back with the, some milk. I, I, I definitely think that's not without in the, you know, that's, that will happen now, you know, that we are going to live that world, right? We are going into complete science fiction here. Uh, as long as we don't implode and we, you know, sound money is kind of the, you know, one of the requirements I think for, for doing this is we, we have to have a system that is, um, that doesn't have, you know, can't, can't be a, a leaky bucket, you know, where things are just, you know, there's, we, we, we just need to have sound money, you know? Um, and, uh, if we have sound money and we have AI, it's going to be an uh, incredible prosperity, I think. So, you know, I think, I think we're going to be in a massively bullish scenario and, and as long, as long as we don't blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons too, but you know, we, we have that, <laughs> we have that small thing to overcome. What do you think is is the intersection of 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 Bitcoin and AI? Will will AI use Bitcoin to transact from mas machine to machine? It's like yeah, uh, I mean it's it's going to have to use some version of wrapped Bitcoin, right? So, and that's why I'm you know I, people for, say Fred, you know, wrap Bitcoin bad. No, I'm like no, it's it's probably what you want, right? You want to have some kind of wrapped Bitcoin, you know? Let's just say. I'm not going to say I'm endorsing Solana here, okay? But I'm not because I don't, and I own no Solana or anything. But like, if you had a wrap Bitcoin on Solana that you could 100% trust, right? That, you know, not that you could just audit it, but that, you know, that it's like you could audit it every second, okay? That, you, you know, and that your, your Bitcoin was segregated somehow and you had all these, you had all these, these, points that gave you a very high confidence that that your your bitcoin wasn't going to be taken away well if if that was the case and you could come in use your wrap bitcoin for transactions right and then the minute you're done with it unwrap it and put it back in you know your vault then great that works you know conceptually that works right you could you're going to execute something very very quickly right pretty much the in seconds, you know, or fractions of a second, right? With very little slippage, very low fees, right? Fees will be under a penny, right? To move things around. Maybe 
under a hundredth of a penny, right? So very super low fees, very very little friction, but the unit of account is Bitcoin. That's what we should fight for. You know, we should fight for the unit of account being Bitcoin, not the dollar, right? So you know, if the unit of account is Bitcoin, and then ultimately it gets swapped back for a real Bitcoin, I'm happy. You know, uh, that will solve everything because then it'll be okay. Great, I can I can send Bitcoin super quickly whether it's me sending it to you or whether it's my machine sending it to your machine, you know, and, uh, but that we have complete redemption on demand, uh, for the real thing. And I can do that every hour, every day, whenever I want. Right. That's sort of, I think the best, best of all worlds. Right. And I think once we have that kind of layer, yeah, machines are going to use it all the time. Right. And they're going to charge microtransactions. It's going to be integrated everywhere, right? So uh, I do think that that's likely to happen. I think the main thing we need to get is we need to get sort of, first of all, we need to get Bitcoin price higher. Right? <laughs> because that's, it's a, it, this is not going to happen if Bitcoin is still competing with the dollar with stable coins. Like we, we have to... I tell people like these stable coins are just this they're not a long term thing you know this is just a transition like you know we we got to get it so bitcoin is already what everybody wants and then the then the question is oh i need to get it cheaper to transact and i think i think we're going to get there you know over the next over the next decade i think it'll be very clear 10 years from now that yeah, I don't. I don't really want U.S. dollars anymore, or euros, digital. You know, they'll have them, but I won't. Want, nobody will want them. I think in ten years, and then it'll be like, okay, I need to get some Bitcoin to you really fast. How do I do it? That that that'll be that'll be the the, the thing you ask. You know, I want to buy this book. I'm gonna I'm gonna send it. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna pay you some Bitcoin. Great, done. You know, how do I do it to you? Lightning. If that that works, great. If there's something else that works better, great. But is, it better be like 100%, have 100% success rate. Like right now, lightning's not, it's not there. And I'm not completely convinced it'll get there. I'm a, I'm a fan of lightning, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent a believer that we're going to get that lightning is going to scale to where we need it to scale with the system that, that it has. David Marcus may disagree with me, may get him to on your show. You know, I, I'd love for him to, to kind of update us all on, you know, on this stuff. And, and, you know, we really need governments to, we need governments to, uh, as you said, like we, we can't have the taxation of this. We can't, a small Bitcoin transaction should not be taxable, right? We shouldn't have to report that you know, I'm, I'm buying a you know a movie ticket with Bitcoin. So we we have to figure out the taxation part of it and the reporting parts of it and the money laundering you know KYC parts of it. I, we we can't. I think Bitcoin's fundamentally not compatible with KYC to me. That that that's interesting because like the like I don't know uh, where it's like where, where you are, but in in Austria, like there, it, it gets harder and harder to get <laughs> no KYC Bitcoin. I mean, you get always like when you just meet up with people that like apps like Vexel, where you can write people like, hey, uh, do you want to exchange something? Uh, but all the exchanges, like they even do your taxes for it now. Like if you have a an exchange, you they do the taxes for you and stuff like that. So like. KYC is, uh, I don't like it, uh, but it's, it seems like more and more like the standard for Bitcoin. It's like the, maybe it's just because we're in a tr transitioning time now. Well, look, I'm, I'm sort of of the opinion. Look, I think a person to really follow here is Eric Voorhees, right? And, you know, look, first of all, KYC doesn't work. It's completely and utterly useless thing. It's not preventing anything. It's not doing anybody any service. It's not. It's not stopping crime. It's not doing anything, right? The only thing it's doing is making Bitcoin transactions more hard for people. That's all it's doing. It's like this layer that's just designed to make Bitcoin less usable. That's it. So 
I really don't think we need KYC. I, I, I would, I mean, I would debate with anybody, Elizabeth Warren, whatever. I don't care, but I, I just don't think it's it's actually useful. You know, we should not care. Um, you know, if somebody's transferring some Bitcoin, does not need to go through. We don't have to have somebody checking whether you're a criminal. It's it's fine. We we have to have free and open money, and that, by the way, was exactly what Satoshi created Bitcoin for, right? It's peer to peer, you know, it doesn't, it's not peer to peer with a KYC in the middle. It's peer to peer. You know, I can send you some money and the, you know, Christine Lagarde is not in the middle of that transaction, you know, and I can send it to you or I can send it to, you know, your cousin who happens to be in Iran, right? It should, you know, when a when a, a bird flies across a border, it doesn't it doesn't stop at customs, you know, it just flies across the border. <laughs> so we have to be in this fluid world where there's this thing called money, which is Bitcoin, which doesn't care about borders, you know, which is completely neutral. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we shouldn't be doing these sanctions, right, to places like Russia. If you don't like Russia, there's other places, other ways to fight Russia, right? Like, if you want to fight Russia, actually, go fight them on the terrain in Ukraine. Go f with guns, you know. Uh, but the idea of, like, sanctioning Russian bank accounts and stuff is, is wrong. Like, the, we should, money should be this neutral thing that um, that these Governments should stick out, get get away from this, you know. And uh, I know it's it's very hard because they want to they want to be in control, right? And there's this huge tendency for them to be super in control, like in China, right, where they can say, "I'm sorry, you said something bad on uh, social media, so you can't actually use the train anymore. Your, your train privileges have been revoked. I'm sorry, right." But to me, that's just the worst thing that could happen, right? Is that we have government is now, it's, it's really something out of like um, Brave New World or 1984, right? Where the, the governments have just become so powerful that they can tell you, they can reach right into your bank account and steal money from you. And so I, I think, you know, as, as, as something that we need to get go forward and we need to have sovereignty of our own money and i think that has to be at a worldwide level and i think we should that money can be should be movable wherever we want and to whoever we want and you know we we have to stop fighting that movement you know we should not try to fight the fact that some money might move to a place that you don't like it to like l let's take politics out let's just make it you know, the internet doesn't care. It's just bits, right? And cryptography is just bits. And, you know, fighting it is, first of all, it's futile. It doesn't work. KYC doesn't work. And so you're, you're fighting a losing battle already with this. So, so just give up on that battle. Embrace the future. Embrace Bitcoin. And we're all going to be better by doing that. And then... You, know, you can have other ways of, of, of fighting these problems. You don't need to fight them that way. And that, that's why I'm, I think I'm very sort of in general in favor of less government intervention, you know, less, less big government. I think, you know, I think Europe is, is, it's, it's very unfortunate in my opinion, what's happened in Europe, you know, and I, I grew up in Europe, so I grew up in France and, um, you know, and I just see this, this in, government's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we have this monster of Brussels and the European Union. And uh, it just, it's insane. It's just like, like we've, we have just this, it's the worst of all worlds, right? We've just created this monster and this, this additional regulatory body that as if we didn't need as if we really needed another regulatory body. Now we have this European Union regulatory body. And so I, I think it's just a very bad system. And I think it's, it's going to break.
I, I definitely think this European system will break. And I think it's, it's, we're starting to see that now, you know, with these right wing governments and stuff and Brexit and everything else. I think European system is going to break and I just, it's not going to continue. And, you know, probably 20, 30 years from now, it, Europe will not exist in the, in the sense that it exists right now. That's my opinion. I also see it on, on, like that. I was a really glowing European Union fan, like when I was young and like, I'm still young, but like five yeah. years ago, uh, but with Bitcoin and the uh, developments, like the last like two, three years that I've seen, I'm really skeptical <laughs> of the European Union, what they're doing and stuff like that. Uh, they're doing small things really wrong. And uh, the big things I'm not a fan of, like <laughs> it's, it's, it's fascinating. But well, look, I mean, I, I've done, I started a company in Germany, uh, in you know back in 2006 and uh, you know we, had, we ended up having a very good exit on this company um but you know so i know the german thing the Ger germany was it's a pretty good place to be in 2010 you know what i mean and now look at germany today okay i mean it's unbelievable i mean the industrial production is going down they're shutting down their nuclear reactors. I, I just don't, it's just, it's insane to me how, how Germany has gone from the, you know, this engine of growth to, I don't know. They're, it, so I, I'm not a fan. I think, uh, you know, I definitely think that you can go wrong. It, it's pretty easy to go wrong with, with big government and, uh, and I, I, you know, I love Europe though. I, I do love being in Europe and I go to Europe often and I, I, you know, I think it's, it's a great place to visit, but I, unfortunately, I think they're doing, they're making a lot of, a lot of mistakes, you know, that honestly the, and we're making a lot of the same mistakes in the U S so unfortunately. Where would you, when, when you have like no family, no connection, no anchor points in any country, and you are like a freedom loving Bitcoiner, where would you be in which country? What, what would be the best place you think? Probably Singapore right now. I mean, you know, it's sort of, you don't have the complete freedom to do whatever you want. Right. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't, you know, necessarily chew gum and throw out your gum. You might get, you might get uh, reprimanded for that pretty, pretty bad. But, uh, but look, I think, you know, I think there's not any really great answer to that question, right? Uh, you know, every every place has its drawbacks. Um, but you know, one of the good things about Bitcoin is, you know, you're you're you you do get you do have more options, right? If you if you get enough Bitcoin, if if the your current place doesn't work for you, you can find another place. And uh, you know, that's uh and I think that's going to be more the case uh, in the future than not, right? I think, you know, there's going to be more countries. It, well, let's say you have, I don't know, let's say you have 50 Bitcoin, right? And 10 years from now, 50 Bitcoin will be worth 50 million bucks, let's just say, right? I think you'll be able, to, you'll have a very wide choice of, um, of places where you can go relocate with your 50 Bitcoin. I think there'll be a lot of people saying, you know, come, come to come to Iceland, uh, you know, or you know, would you like to come to Peru? We have a, we have special, uh, you know, visas for Peru, you know, like wh whatever you want to do. Right. So I think it gives you a lot of options and, uh, and, you know, and I think even moving fiat money is not necessarily even that, that easy. Right. So, you know, it's just, you know, if you're European and you want to come to the U S you know, you're going to be filling out all kinds of forms and everything. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to have more of a fluid world in, in the future. Uh, and definitely, you know, having a lot of Bitcoin is kind of, it gives you that sort of worldwide passport, but you know, you know, you'll be able to pick and choose some, some good places to live. One thing before we come to the end routine that yeah. I thought about when you talked about KYC, do you also see a problem or like a threat to centralizing where coins are held, like Coinbase, Bitcoin ETFs, so the massive uh, honeybots? Do you see this as a threat? Perhaps. I mean, uh, I think 
I think we're still at the very early stages of, um, I mean, look, the ETF is, you know, what, six months old. So, you know, I think some of these things are going to, they'll, they'll diversify, you know, they just haven't done it now for, they just wanted to, this is, they just have to submit something to the, the SEC as to where they're going to be holding their coins. Um, but, uh, you know, a more, we're going to get to more. We're going to get to better solutions than just having Coinbase hold them. It's not something that worries me right now, today, right? I, I don't think that that's a problem. And, you know, you, you, but you should probably diversify yourself. You know, if you're holding ETFs, hold a couple of different ETFs, right? Buy the Fidelity ETF. They do their own self-custody, you know, also have, you know, the BlackRock ETF, um, I definitely think also we're going to get to so in-kind distribution of ETFs in, in the next couple of years. So, you know, an ETF can be viewed as kind of a wallet in a way, right? So, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's nothing quite like self-custody, but self-custody also is, you know, it's, it's somewhat tricky for most people. Um, you really need to use multi-sig and what that really means is you really need to use a service like Casa or Unchained Capital or Relay, I guess, as in Switzerland does it. Um, I'm not so, so familiar with the European, you know, who does, who does multi-sig in Europe? Who, who does it in Europe? Multi, good multi-sig. I mean, you can also use, uh, Casa and Unchained in, uh, in, in, uh, Europe actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, there are like also services like the Bitcoin Way and 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 um, how right. Yeah, I was thinking sort of European advisor. specific ones, but I don't... Uh, but I I don't know specific Europeans. That yeah, I, I mean those 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 are those are both very good services. Okay, so um, you know I I use Casa myself for 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 some of my Bitcoin, and I also um, I'm very familiar with Unchain, and I recommend it highly. So. Uh, uh, and you know, you should also have the founder of Unchained, well, Drew. You should get him on your show. Oh yeah, definitely. I had some. Uh, I think two people already from Unchained on, but the founder was was not there. I, I definitely have to get him. Who did you have? Oh man, uh, Trey Sellers. I think it is his name. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. Forgot, I forgot that. I wanna. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I just think it's you know the problem is when when you do these things yourself and you do them right it's, you know, at some point you're, you, you do have to trust the other par party. Like you have to trust Casa or Unchained, all their processes and everything. They're probably not going to ever lose your Bitcoin, but you know, you know, if, if Unchained went, their website went dark, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you as a, you as a, uh, Unchained customer, you would be like, what, what, what happened? Where's my money? And even though you probably have a way of recouping it and everything, it'll cause you probably a minor heart attack that day. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It seems to me that for, for most people, the ETF is going to be the ultimately the best solution. And what you really want is you want this in kind distribution, right? So that if you want to move it out of the ETF into Bitcoin, you don't have to move it into cash and then buy the Bitcoin. You can just go ETF to Bitcoin very easily in and out, right? And so I think that's going to happen in the next 24 months. We're going to have, uh, you know, we'll, we will have in-kind distribution for ETFs. Um, and, and at that point, I mean, that's going to be a huge engine of growth for ETFs as well, right? Because if you can use these ETFs as kind of like, if I can go and move five Bitcoin over to IBIT. Now I have, I have, you know, it'd be about be a hundred, let's say it's like uh, 30,000 uh, shares of IBIT, right? If I go, here's five Bitcoin, I'm changing it for 30,000 shares of IBIT and then back and forth and I can do that. Then why do I really need self-custody? You know, I mean, I can, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't need, I could just have a ledger and just move, move it back and forth with my ledger and, you know, I don't really, I could use IBIT for most of my stuff or whatever, Fidelity or whatever it is for most of my Bitcoin. And then I can move it back easily onto, onto a ledger. And I think that's almost the best of, best of all worlds, right? 
Um, and so uh, it's a, it, I think that's, so I think I'm very bullish on these ETFs. I think they're going to be, they're going to be, we haven't seen anything yet. I think the it's, it's just going to grow like crazy. And, uh, and, and it's going to be, look, it's, this is going to be the, the thing that BlackRock did that is going to be, that's going to be their main thing is this, this I bet that's, it's going to be like SPY or QQQ, right? I mean, it's just, this is going to, this will be, this is how most people are going to get into Bitcoin. They're going to buy this ETF. That's what they're going to do. Most people. Um, so it's, it's, but I also think that, you know, it, it, it'd be great if over the next couple of years, we, we push for Bitcoin usage. So even if it's not, even if it's small, I do love the fact that people are using their ledgers or even their mobile wallets or whatever it is. Right. But just get, getting to use Bitcoin. I'd love, I'd love to push that. So I, you know. I'm part of part of one of the things I would like to do is to, and I'd encourage you to do it too, which is uh, promote the actual use of Bitcoin. You know, so I was sort of sort of half joking, but not really half joking. I said like, if somebody wants to sponsor me and give me a steak, I'll just sell. You know, and they accept beef for Bitcoin. I'll grill the Bitcoin, the steak. I'll taste it. I'll tell you how good it is, and I'll send them to their website, you know, and, you know, I think it's, I think that's something we can do, you know, uh, I think it's a very good thing that people actually play around with Bitcoin a little bit more and buy stuff with it and, and get, get you using it. And it's not going to impact the price of Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin is going to be for savings and everything. But I do think it's, I think it's part of the thing is using Bitcoin, you know? So, yeah, so. I, I get paid from some of my sponsors in Bitcoin. So, uh, there I, you go. That, that's, that's a really cool uh, feeling from like a Bitcoin company sponsoring a Bitcoin podcast that they are paying in Bitcoin. Who are some of your sponsors, by the way? I'm just curious. Uh, I have uh, Bitbox. I have uh, okay. the Bitcoin Way. Uh, and I got also 21 Bitcoin. Uh, but they are just in Germany and Austria. So uh, okay. we kind of right. evolved that because my audience is mostly in America, UK and Canada. Uh, right. But those are like Bitbox and, and the Bitcoin way. And there are some new ones coming out probably soon. So Robin, give me your, uh, send me your address also in your, um, your, your phys a physical address or a PO box. And I will send you a copy of my book. Oh, I would love to. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I, I, with my co-author, I have two co-authors on this book. One is uh, Ben Sigmund, and then we have a designer, Lee Steffens. And we we put together a book, and we uh, we we sold out of the book, but we kept uh, we kept a hundred copies for for friends and family and other people. And so I'll be happy to give you one. But we sold out in uh, in thirteen hours, and we sold nine hundred copies of this book at two hundred dollars a copy. So we we, we took in we took in one hundred and eighty thousand dollars in under twenty four hours, but we've we built this book and we sold out. I, we're not sure what we're going to do from here. It's sort of it may just be a one off that we just did this one book, but uh, uh, what we might do a second edition. Uh, but it's 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 a it's a coffee table book, and um, and I, I hope you like it. But we've we've gone through and we've interviewed a lot of people. A lot of the OGs, and uh, we've 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 done a, a ton of research, and and we produced all these graphs and stuff, and you know, like charts and all that. So, but we tried to make a very beautiful kind of art book. Um, so uh, it's sort of like a Toshin style book. Uh, it, is it with a lot of visuals and and stuff? And it's all visual. It? It's not. It's almost. It's very little text, so it's a very different. So it's a, a very different thing, yeah. So it started out as a, it started out as almost like a te regular textbook, text video, you know, a lot of like every other book on Bitcoin. And then I started writing it, and this guy Lee came to me, and he's like, "Look, Fred, you seem to have a lot of reach, and and you're kind of disruptive on Twitter, and I follow you. It's like, would you consider doing a?" a different kind of format book because format really matters. And I'm like, hmm, yeah, I think I would. And then he goes, well, what do you think if we did sort of a coffee table book? And it's like, I'm this graphic designer. I've done all this Apple stuff. And, and so I was like, yeah, I like, I like this idea. And so, uh, 
So we basically kind of reformatted everything. And so we, we, we've, we've, it's, it's all pictures and, uh, yeah. And, uh, it's just visual, you know? So, so yeah, so that's, that's what we did. And I, I hope you'll like it, but, uh, I'll, I'll get you a copy. We don't, I can't, can't, I just can't give too many out, but I'd, I'd love to have you and just, you could show it to people in Europe and, uh, uh, and so on, but you uh, know, we've got, we've got, we got a ton of, ton of really interesting stories and stuff that we, that we, that we, that we got and photos and stuff. It's, it's interesting. I will share it. And I, I will also yeah. make like, um, uh, a, a nicer studio at one point to have something in the background on the long might, uh, just put it there, uh, yeah. as, as some of yeah, the yeah. things. Yeah. So I hope so you enjoy it. You know, we, we, we got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stories from the really early days and, it's like a friend of mine was the first person who invented proof of work. So, yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, uh, she is a, a researcher at, uh, IBM research, uh, San Jose. And she came up with this original paper that she presented in 1992. That was the original paper. Uh, her name is Cynthia de work. And so she came out with this concept of it in 92 and uh and then adam back came out with sort of a much more up-to-date version of it in 1997 um so five years later or so, yeah and so and, and then you know david chom and we we talked at chom and we had i had i had he made me lunch and we talked about you know because nick sabo used to work for chom you know so I, I dug up and we've, we've talked to Sabo about this stuff. And so, yeah. So we, really we, cool. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that, that's, that's the book. I hope you enjoy it. And, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, that's, I think that's a, it's a, it's a great ending point for the podcast. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on and, you know, uh, yeah, hello uh, to the European Bitcoiners. Yeah. B before I can let you go, yeah. uh, I have a small end routine where I have two questions. The one is always the same one for everyone. And the other one comes from the previous guest. Um, okay. the one, the first one is, uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? I think, uh, take a look at my, if you want to see something completely crazy, you go to fredkruger.org. I put a website up and I have a ton of stuff there, including my PhD thesis at Stanford. Uh, if you, if you want to look at just completely in, insane research project I did on, uh, arrangements of hyperplanes and dearrangements and, uh, random polyhedra that I did in 1986. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of crazy stuff, including some stuff on power law, various other audit oddities and mathematical things. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff there on Fred Krueger and things that I find interesting and also people that I find interesting or videos that I find interesting and art that I find interesting. So I just put it up there. You can look at it. So that that's me. Go to fredkruger.org. Just created it the other day. Amazing. Really cool. I just looked at that uh, cool website. <laughs> <laughs> you click on the links there. There's a page that says links and uh, and you can see there's like all this stuff about distribution mm. of bitcoin addresses or how the amms work or the amm math and all this stuff so so i just put i just kind of like anytime that i i'm, I'm seeing some something new that i like there um or or <laughs> i even have like a list of all the bitcoiners that you can follow on twitter and i rank yeah. them by uh the kruger 69 what the kruger 69 yeah I think I'm number 42. I'm very quantitative, so I measure everything. So I was like, okay, well, how do I stack up against everybody else? So I'm, I'm kind of currently about to hit 75,000 followers. Um, and so I, I kind of, I kept track of that. I even keep track of like how many, how many, you know, how many followers per day I'm averaging. And it's just like Matt, just I'm a math guy. I'm a nerd, you know, so it's just, I, I, I track everything, you know, but yeah, so you can look at that. I love that a lot. It's, it's really cool. I also track it very closely. Uh, this is more YouTube than Twitter. Uh, but yeah. I, I love you should, that. Oh, by the way, you should, uh, you should definitely be more on Twitter too, because I was the opposite. I did Twitter only and not YouTube. 
And then somebody, somebody came to me and said, uh, Fred, you should do YouTube as well. And I was like, okay, I don't think, I don't really have time for YouTube. But then I, then I started it and, uh, I'm like, well, yeah, YouTube makes, YouTube makes a lot of sense. So I think, uh, it, there's, there's one piece of advice to, I would have to you is also do Twitter. Also take your videos that you're doing on YouTube. Uh, take the actual raw video, put it on Twitter as well. Oh, I do that actually. Yeah. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's, oh, it's but not like there. link to the YouTube one. No, no, no. It's, it's actually like the, the full okay. video. I, okay. I put that on Twitter. Like I, Actually, come I was going to say, build, build your Twitter up. Build your Twitter up. The two things feed into each other. And the way I look at it is the Twitter is kind of the newspaper or the radio show. And uh, YouTube is the library, right? So, you know, if I'm just going and I just sort of want to say, okay, what's new in the world today? Twitter. And that's what's new in the world today. And then is where was that one video of him interviewing Sailor? That's YouTube, you know, so, so the library, so the Robin Sayer library can be YouTube, but I want, I kind of want to see, I kind of, you got to develop a little bit more of your Twitter personality or presence. So absolutely. You can do that and you can, you can surpass me on Twitter. <laughs> I, will, I will try that's, my best. Absolutely, absolutely fine. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to have some competition. Amazing. Perfect, I'm pretty then. good at, I'm pretty good at Twitter though. I'm, I have to say I'm better competitively at Twitter, but not because of uh, um, videos and stuff. But I'm 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 kind of witty, so I come like, I'm I'm pretty good at like kind of putting these little words. And sometimes the really short tweets get more traffic than like whole long interviews and stuff. So you know. You just have to find the exact right little word to to put. It's and just, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a game, you know. It's a game. I'm not I'm not doing it to make money. And my money is in Bitcoin, you know. That's that's I'm I'm fortunate that I've I've I'm fortunate that I've done pretty well in life. And and I'm passionate about Bitcoin and uh you know, I'm part of me is just trying to stay occupied and uh and and not and not lose the religion and uh and, you know, it's all, it's all a period. So I think, I think we're in a very good period for Bitcoin. I think, you know, we're, we won't always, we'll have a crash. We'll do, we are going to, you know, it's not going to be all roses, but uh, for now, I think we're in a, we're in a good, we, we have, we're in a, the future right now is pretty bright for the next, the next couple of years, I think. And uh, could be real, could be, could be a, we could be at the beginning of a five-year bull market. Nothing says that we have to be in these four-year cycles. In my opinion, it could be like a ten-year gold rush kind of a thing, like this. Could it be could, thing. I think so. Well, look, I mean, yeah, these, you know, the the previous, the four-year cycle thing is like linked to these halvings. The halvings are not as important anymore. Um, so maybe we'll have a cycle just because we're like trained to have cycles now. But um, you know. I don't see any actual supply demand reason why we have to go to every four years crash 75%. Like, no, why, you know, like, you know, the stock market's gone up for, you know, it's, it's pretty much gone up with, with just a few crashes nonstop for 30 years. So, you know, could Bitcoin go up for 30 years? I think so. Will there be some crashes? Yeah. Some point there are going to be some crashes, but no, it's being mainly in Bitcoin is, is, a, is, is a, it's kind of, a, I think it's a good, good place to be right now. So, um, I, and I think we're going to do, we're going to do fine. We're going to do fine over the next five years. So I'm super supportive of any, anybody who wants, you know, anybody who wants to interview, get an interview, interview me or whatever. I'm, I'm, yeah, to the extent that I have the time, I'm I'm certainly. I love it. Uh, I love that yeah. you uh, opened with that and, and took the yeah. time also today uh, yeah, to come on. Thanks, uh, and what was the other? So that was it, right? Yeah, that this was like the first question. Like I have an oh, interview. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, okay. uh, without knowing who the next guest is. It's it's really cool because it gives that like, like a new question, um, and we did not cover it uh, till now. Um, the question is for you, how do you foresee the regula uh, regulations, politics and banks of the world playing a role in Bitcoin over the coming years, especially now with the US elections? I would really hope 
that they they do as little as possible um because i think the the opportunity for them to screw it up is really big um that that's that's what i would say and look i once you know i was involved in the domain name business with ICANN uh for years and years before before this and uh, you know i once attended a um uh, uh, a talk given by Bill Clinton and Bill was saying, he goes, you know, when the internet came out, we had to, uh, we had to decide. And he goes, Oh, I had a lot of people were saying we should tax it, you know, like put a tax on email. And he goes, a lot of people were saying that, you know, and tax and email. What? yeah, they were like, look, we have taxes on everything else. Why don't we have, you know, this is like postage. It's going to put the post office out of business. Why don't we just have a small tax on every email, you know, like, and so, you know, and tax on e-commerce and everything. They, they were, they were really, they were looking at this as a potential revenue source. Right. And so I think that the, you know, if you're, you know, they say the expression, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, or, sorry, if you're a nail, everything looks like a hammer. I don't even know the expression, but, but you, you know, if you're a regulator, you want to regulate, right? So you really need to stop and think, why do you want to regulate? Why does this thing need regulation? Okay. And I'd argue it doesn't need regulation, right? It does not need to be regulated. Get your KYC hands off of it. Get, you know, just, just hands off. You know, that, that's, that's what I would say. And it's sort of like, it's kind of like the internet. When, when the internet started, it was not, people were saying, well, this thing is going to be used by terrorists, right? It's going to be used by criminals and terrorists and everything else. And, uh, and you know, it is, it is used. The internet is used by terrorists, right? It doesn't mean that we should not have it, right? And is Bitcoin used by terrorists? Yes, it is. Is cash used by terrorists? Yes, they are, you know? Do terrorists use the French Paris Metro? Yes, they do, you know? Does that mean we have to KYC at the entrance of the Metro to see that, okay, wait a second, the terrorists can't go in this Metro? No, no you know? So we have to be very careful about regulation because... Uh, you know, this stuff works when it's best, when it's deregulated. And I think in general, in Europe, they've just, they piled way too much regulation. You know, they have regulation as to, you know, what you know, champagne is, you know, or what everything, you know, what, what the size of a, a pen is, you know, like this is a standard European pen it can only be this size and gonna have this type of ink. I'm like, like We've got to get away from this regulation, you know. It's it's just not useful. So I'm super anti-regulation. Uh, I think you know we have to have some, but we have to be very. It's, you should really think really hard about this regulation. So especially with something like Bitcoin, and it should not be anybody who says regulation is good for crypto or Bitcoin. They're out of their mind. Is not good, right? It is not our friend. It is not, it is not it, it's like people are like, well, it's going to help people investors. No, it won't. You know, it's, it's not good. People, it, it's not, people are not buying Bitcoin because it's insufficiently regulated. That's not the reason why they're not buying Bitcoin. That's, that's, that, that, that there's other reasons, but that's not the reason. So that's very true. Yeah. It's a, that, that's a good line uh, that, with the regulations. Yeah, perfect. Um, before I let you go, uh, where can people reach out to you? What's the best place to, to find your things? Just uh, my, Twitter. If my Twitter. My Twitter is .kruger is the single place to reach out. And you can see uh, on there, I put the link to my website on there as well. So just just go there and, you know, and, uh, you know, participate in the discussion or participate in one of my spaces or uh, so I, I have I'm kind of like, I'm pretty open. I'm spaces and everything. So I kind of like to, you know, be a host for the community and anybody, anybody wants to do something, you want to be a space, you want to talk. I want to my spaces. Come on up. I'll request to be a speaker. You'll, you'll get to talk. And unless you're completely obnoxious, you're going to stay to be a speaker. 
if you're coming and you're plugging Caspa or some other coin like that, I will kick you off. But uh, I, I but like yeah. that. <laughs> That's just me, you know. <laughs> uh, but if you want to talk Bitcoin and you have some opinion or something, look, it's uh, yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Hey, Robin, where are, what country are you in? Austria? Is that where you are? Ah, yes, Austria. Okay. Okay. The ho home of Austrian economics. <laughs> the home of uh, Vienna? Is that where you are? Vienna? Yeah, Vienna, or? actually. Vienna. Vienna okay. and, uh, right. the, the main place. I will send you my, my box so you, uh, for the book. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we'll send, we'll send you a copy of the, uh, of the big Bitcoin book. And thank thanks you. for having and me on Thank you, Fred, for, for, for joining us today and for everyone okay. watching and listening. Uh, thank you for joining I enjoyed it, man. Thank you. Bye-bye.